Hello, um, my name is Francis. This is going to be a video about history and our perception of history. Um, it's my first video. Got to start somewhere, and the history topic has always interested me. Uh, even before I got into um, looking for the truth and discovering that we've been lied to on quite a big scale and other topics. So, what's our story? How did we end up? where we are and what has happened. So, um, a few years ago, started to get interested in the material that was coming out about possible resets in history and mud floods and that sort of thing. And so, with the same scepticism and kind of thinking that I've been looking into other topics, I thought, well, I really want to know what's happened. So. Where do we start? So my local environment I discovered there were some good examples of buried buildings. And so I'm just going to start with that. When I say about a perception of history, um, I suppose there's kind of two kinds of ways of looking at thinking. And I find myself going back and forward between the two kinds when I'm trying to research. Um, the, you know, on the one hand, you've got the 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 way that most people look at history, the vast majority, that is that we do know just about everything. All the important details have been established. There's been thousands of scholars and historians beavering away, cross-referencing everything, and um, you know, there's nothing major wrong with our history. All the major events and characters have been documented and established, um, and there's nothing untoward. Um, we haven't been lied to in a big way about anything like that. <clears throat> but those of us that are more sceptical tend to look for the physical evidence now because we don't take everything at face value, um, what we read or what we're told. Uh, so what you find in scholarly books and Wikipedia and so on, we can't just accept wholesale without comparing it to what we can see with our eyes. Um, so what we've got here is uh, Linlithgow Palace in Scotland, in Linlithgow in Scotland. And so I'm kind of jumping in the deep end a little bit in the sense that this is a well, it's a very popular, well-documented uh, building, uh, quite a big tourist attraction. Its main claim to fame is the birthplace of Mary Queen of Scots in the mainstream history and the residence for the monarchs of Scotland in the 15th. 16th century. And so it's quite an important building in Scottish history. Um, and they've been, um, if I just pop to the Wikipedia page briefly, uh, they've been um, treating this building, this palace, as a historic site for a long time. Uh, yeah, at present day, the palace has been actively concerned, uh, conserved since the early 19th century. So for 200 years, it's been a historic site and uh, a tourist attraction. So they've had a long time to get the, the story about it and everything we know about it and so on. Um, it has been unused, um, except as this historic site and tourist attraction since way back 1745, when uh, the Duke of Cumberland's army destroyed most of the palace buildings by burning. burning in January 1746. So that's what they're telling us about the the last use of the building as um, a palace was way back then. And since then, it's been, uh, since the early 1800s, it's been a historic site. Okay, um, I'll just go back to the um, aerial picture here. It's quite a good one for uh, showing the overall situation nowadays of this palace. Um, what would strike anybody who's you know been thinking about resets and buried buildings, mud floods, all that kind of thing, is it's a pretty good example of a partially buried building. If you're looking with that eye, um, with very uneven ground all round. So to the... Um, south side you have this old church as well, St Michael's Church, another very old building. 
and that's at the top of the hill there where the entrance nowadays the entrance to the palace is opposite that church on the side that we can't see on the south side at a sort of street level right at the top of the hill and then there is a level courtyard um, which I'll show you in a little bit inside the centre of that building um, and then the rest of the building is built around that courtyard and has varying degrees of descent that you can get down to. I haven't examined it inside properly yet. I've only been in there once, but it looks as if you can get down more or less uh, on the outside portions of the building, varying degrees of descent corresponding to more or less what you can see outside here. So I'm presuming that they're thinking the building was built like this as you see it now somehow or other um, not built on level ground but just the only level bit is the central courtyard in the middle and then the rest of it seems to be built around that going down as the hill goes down and varying how much it goes down a, a very odd and complex task that would have been to build but that's I'm presuming what they they, uh, they think if insofar as they think about it at all and that's where I get to these two perceptions of history that I'm talking about. Um, this uh, loch here, this little lake, comes right round uh, to this north side. So the building is in between the, the lake and the, uh, the um, town, between the north and the south. In particular, on this uh, northeast side, it goes right down very low there and there's another structure here which we're going to go into uh, right at that corner okay we've built with a different stone and it built at a different time that was telling us okay so we've got that to look at but you can see how uneven the ground is if I go to um, this one that's us down there at that strange structure that I was showing you from above down in the northeast corner and this is where it all started for me because at the end of 2016 uh, Margaret and I were sitting by this big sycamore tree here and Margaret suddenly pointed to the arrow slit on the ground there uh, in that tower I said oh look at that and it was quite startling to me because I hadn't noticed it even though I'd walked around here several times many times um, I just hadn't registered it because I hadn't been thinking in terms of what's under the ground. So I thought, why well, hadn't I noticed that before? And Because the, the implication is that there's a large portion of this tower under the ground. Um, and I don't think I would have ever wondered how much of this palace, since in the background there, the lighter stone colour, was under the ground unless I had become acquainted with the ideas of mud floods and buried buildings and so on. It might not have it never have entered my head. I just thought this is just just like everybody else that walks by here. This is just an old building. We know everything we need to know about it, and that's what it looks like. End of story. Uh, but when you walk around the building with looking for it, it looks pretty obvious that there's large portions under the ground. Okay, so that's that. Uh, bit down here in the northeast corner. What I'm going to show you now is how, as far as the general public are concerned, and academia, and the way that this building, this tourist attraction, this historic site is presented to the public, I'm going to prove to you shortly that it's presented as if um, the way you see it now is the way it's always looked in terms of the ground level and its overall situation. They seem to imply that with everything that they do. And I shall prove that to you. They're not thinking in terms of the ground level ever having changed. Um, which is very strange, but I'll show you. Um, there, are we? there we go. So this is a little... Um, plaque out at the front of the palace. There's that church you could see. And um, 
It says here an artist's impression about 1530 of building works commissioned by James V. Okay, and I'm just going to zoom in on this little bit here. Okay, now this gate, this entrance here is now the main entrance. It was moved round from the east side to this north, uh, to the south side, closer to the town. And that's the way, the way you go in. I mean, you go through there, you come out into this level courtyard at the top of the hill. Okay. Um, now, uh, that's what I'm looking for. Okay, so there's a photograph of the same portion of the palace, the front entrance, what's now the front entrance nowadays, with the car park and everything, and that's where the visitors come in to go in to see. Okay, so I'm just going to go back and forward between these two. Um, there's the artist's impression of 1530 and how it looks, and there it is now. So you can see from the ground level point of view, it's exactly the same. And nobody has come up to the artist and said, um, oh, sorry. Right, you, you better not just draw it because we're talking about 1530, hundreds of years ago, you've got buried arches and things, so we need to try and draw it as the way it was back then. No, nobody's bothered to say that. I said, there's the palace, draw it, please. Can you depict this? And the artist has just depicted what he's seen, more or less, and added in some 1500-ish uh, looking people. Um, and there you go. So from this side, it looks the same as it looks now. Okay, so they're not thinking that there's anything buried under here, under this car park or the walls go down or anything like that. Certainly not as far as public concerned because they all see this plaque with the artist's depiction and say, oh right, it looked the same. 1530, it was the same as it is now, same ground level. Okay. So that's on this side. And then if we go to the very interesting east side, okay, so when I showed you the picture from above, I was pointing out this structure here. So you, this is on the east side now that it goes away down in the northeast corner. So you can see that great big slope coming away down there. That's the top, uh, the church is just up here on the street level there. So you come into the level courtyard in the middle of this building and then look at this, it goes way, way down. All right, and then this was the original entrance, apparently, they tell us, when it was first built. And it had a drawbridge going up to it. Okay. Um, if I just go back to the aerial photograph briefly, there we are. So we were looking at it from that uh, east side there. Now, this structure here was, uh, they tell us, is an add-on. It was put on somewhat later after the building was originally built. Not that much later, about 100 years or so. Um, as a fortified gate, a barbican, um, and a bulwark. Um, presumably to buttress the wall. He's got these flying buttresses going up here, they call them that. Um, Maybe to stop it sliding down the hill? I don't know. Anyway, your guess is as good as to mind precisely what the function of these buttresses would be. But anyway, there they are. And there were there's the remains of three towers here. Okay, we saw the one with the arrow slip in the ground, the nearest one to the big tree down there. And this was the original entrance, this big hole in the wall here. And they, uh, they had apparently a drawbridge, a, a bridge going up to it, a little drawbridge there back in when it was first built 1400s so 1300s so let's go back and have a look at their depiction of um, that so on the, the side of the palace I've got another little plaque showing you there it says James the fourth later added a barbican or forework to the right of the entrance so this is depicting it before that barbican was put up possibly topped with turrets his reinforcements added grandeur and strengthened the wall. The flying buttresses are all that remain. Okay, so if you look at that, they're depicting the same ground levels here as we see now, with the slope coming down, more or less the same. And then, as I said, this little bridge going up. 
and a wee drawbridge going up to the hole in the wall, which was the original gate, and then they moved it round apparently to the south side where we've got it now. So you can see from those two depictions that they're assuming that the ground levels as we see them now have always been there. Have all, uh, it's never changed much. It's the same basic. So the the building must have been built like this with all this uneven ground taken into account. That's certainly how it looks as if it's being presented to the public. So that leaves a bit of a puzzle and um, I can think I can prove or certainly very strongly indicate that the ground levels have changed in one way or another. Um, I'll show you that in just a little bit. But if you just think about it for a moment, how would you build this around that central courtyard, which is at this, up at the street level? Let's just assume that it was a hill that came up and there was a little flat bit at the top that they put the courtyard on. And then they built out from there, going down in varying degrees of descent. How difficult would that be? And how would they... You'd have to go down and explore all these dark rooms which you can hardly see when you go in down at the, below the street level there and find out what's actually going on between there and the... Now, I did ask when I was in uh, if there was anything under the central courtyard. I'll maybe give you a look at that. Um, central courtyard. There we go. I asked when I was in... There's those two entrances, by the way. That's the original east one and now the, the north one as you come into the central courtyard with the fountain, which is fascinating as well, but that's for another video. But anyway, there you got this nice flat bit, and I asked if there was anything underneath. He said, no, you can go lower down, but through these entrances and then down. But there's nothing under there, apparently. Um, and of course, for... Um, from my way of thinking, people that have looked into to this, you would assume that you would build this on level ground, the entire building, and then something has occurred over the years to cause it to look like this, whether that's a gradual thing or a sudden thing or a series of sudden things, something has changed the ground levels. Okay, so if it is built on level ground, then we would need to go way, way down. And the problem is for them, with this barbican, which is, must be a pain in the neck for them. That this is as far down as you can get. You can look out these little windows down here and you can see the top of the barbican. That's as far down as you get. Apparently there's some kitchen down here in this bottom northeast corner. But we're going down further still with this. You know, and you were just to assume that the building was built with this big slope, these big slopes taken into account. But we need to go a lot further down still. Um, there's a good one of the same Barbican which just shows you how buried it is and you just wonder why haven't they excavated how far down does this go down what's the rest of this like you'd think they'd be interested in finding out nope they just left it like this very strange um, there's an awful lot of interesting things about this structure which I'll probably leave to another video because um, I need to get more photos and stuff like that but for just now it's a bit of an anomaly um, as far as I'm concerned because uh, it's quite different in the way it's constructed from the palace itself different stone and everything now they do say that it was added on later as a fortified gate trouble with it being a fortified gate is that there's just these three towers on this side of that entrance so if it was going to be 40, you would think they would continue it right across so that it would be symmetrical relative to that gate. So maybe they've got the hill in the way, so they didn't bother fortifying that side. So they would just expect all the attackers to come up this direction, like in a... If, they kind, if you would kindly attack from the uh, northeast, please, uh, where we've got our towers. Um, so that's a bit odd as well. Um, so maybe they, they would just fall back and say, oh, it was mainly a bulwark and just an appearance thing. Because usually they just make up, people will justify things, they'll come up with excuses on the spot sometimes, I've found. 
I'm going to give examples of that in another video. Not necessarily to do with this, but to do with other topics. The way people can just invent stuff to defend. Anyway, how do you defend that? If that's a fortified gate, why is it only on one side of the gate that you're fortifying? Very strange. Um, and yet we've saw from that depiction that this big slope, they assume, was always there. So as far as the general public and academia are concerned, except with academia perhaps, be at the very top, there might be a select few that know the real story, but everybody's just, it never occurs to anyone to think about the the building of this, taking all the uneven ground into account. Um, I'll just show you a picture from across the, um, if I can find it quickly, other side of the, the loch, have I got that one? Oh, I didn't bring that one, unfortunately. But you can see just how... Oh, there we go. So what I think may be the case, where those trees are is down that bottom northeast corner, and you've got the barbican behind that, way, way down. And if that tower goes on, you're almost going down to the level of the water here, the level of the loch. Um, and so the whole building may go down as deep as that originally, which would be incredible. But there's been no great big excavation just to see what the whole situation is. They've just left it and then assumed and built all their history around that. So that gives them all kinds of problems. There's another picture from the north side. Oh, um, there's a historic Scotland one. I'll just see if I can find it. I forgot to bring it up, uh, which, is, which depicts the east side again. Let's see if I've got that. Um, usually pops up on this. This is just the Google Pictures. If I can't find it quickly, I'll just leave it. Showing the uh, east side. There we go. Right, so this is um, Scottish Castle series, Lonethical Palace, and down here they've got this one. The above illustration shows the east range of the palace built by King James I. It contained the original entrance. So there's that original entrance. The Barbican was added by James IV. We've covered that already. But there's not much left of the four towers today. We're now ready to enter the palace. Right. Well, the problem is there's no remains of this fourth tower anywhere on the ground or in any other pictures or uh, engravings that I've looked at or anyone or any other sites that I've seen. So this seems to be peculiar to historic Scotland. They've just invented this fourth tower to make it look a bit more sensible as a gate, as a as a defensive barbican. Also, the way that the artist here has squashed this in, this does not correspond at all to what's on the ground. We've got this rather treaty looking bridge going up, but there's that northernmost tower, and they're pretending that that's the bottom of the tower. When we know that's the bottom, not the bottom. They've just tried to squash in four towers. They've not left enough room for the buttresses. It doesn't make any sense. The artist has just tried to force some kind of um, gate that makes sense onto onto the side of the palace. But if we go back to the um, tower, this is this tower on the right of that previous picture. Yeah. Um. But that's not the bottom of the tower that they were showing. They just showed that little lip there at the bottom of the tower, but it obviously goes further down still. So the artist has been a little bit, a bit of artistic license to try and squash it in. Okay, so I've got all kinds of problems with this built, with this structure. And now, I said earlier that I would try and um, show you where are we oh 
Oh, there we go. Sorry. <laughs> Forgot to put it at the start. Yeah. This depiction. Now, this is one of John Slezer's engravings from his work. Um, Theatrum Scotti. Um, this is this Dutch or German guy who came over in the 1600s and kindly drew all the main fortifications and important historical places in Scotland. Very handy indeed. So whenever you go to, to uh, one of these big tourist sites in Scotland, up pops one of his pictures to illustrate what it looked like in the 1600s, somewhat later. Okay, we're moving forward a couple hundred years in time. Um, so you'd think that's great because we'd get an idea of what it looked like in between um, the 1400s and now. And what do we have? Well, this is from the other side, unfortunately. We don't get to see the Barbican round on the west, uh, on the east side. This is looking west, looking east. But if you look at the ground levels, he's leveled it all out which is completely contradictory to what I showed you earlier when they were suggesting with their depictions that they're showing the public now that the uneven ground has always been there whereas he's showing it all level um, if I can try and compare that to this one right, so the Slezer one um, that's that. I'm going to show you that north side in detail. Okay, there. Look at that big slope going down, and you can see the top of that Barbican. Though you can see quite a bit of that Barbican, the big buttress coming up there. You've got the great big slope. But John Slezer, if he was uh, accurate in any way from the 1600s, hasn't got that big slope. It's all level going right round. And if that continues right round the whole palace, then we have the Barbican completely buried, or almost completely buried in the 1600s. That fortified gate is com almost completely buried. And he's certainly not showing you any slope. You can see that's the same... Um, sorry. The same bit. Yeah, this, the wind, if you examine all the windows, he's, he's drawn them all accurate except for one. Okay, you can get one wrong, that's fair enough. But he hasn't bothered drawing in the slope, so presumably the slope wasn't there in his day. Now, what's even more interesting is there's another engraving from 1782, if I can just find that one. Sorry, should have done this better. Where is it? that one. Yeah, 1782, Palace of the from a drawing by T. Heron, engraved by W. Byrne and T. Medlin. So this is 1782, this is this east side again. You can see there the ruined towers, much the same, um, all overgrown, and there's that hole in the wall all bricked up in that. In 1782, although it was open at the beginning and it's open now, so that's strange, all bricked up in the middle. But look what's going on here. On this side of the, on the south side of this old entrance, here we have the ground high, right up against the wall, right up at the level of the top of that buttress almost, instead of the big slope coming away down. And then it abruptly ends, and it's either been dug out or it didn't continue round. But if we'd continued that height of whatever this is, this mud or this hillside. If we continued that right to the corner, then we would get the same height that John Slezer drew coming round. So that would imply that there was the, 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 the peel, that's this royal park around the palace. You can see everybody walking around in here. Um, this that would imply that in John Slessor's time in the 1600s and then uh, it was all level ground from here right right round basically the whole palace and this would Barbican would have been completely buried or almost completely buried for hundreds of years but he didn't unfortunately never do it from this side what a shame 
Um, you may have gathered I'm a little bit suspicious of John Slezer, and if I've got time, I'll just briefly touch on, on why. But um, anyway, he's drawing it nice and level, but high, right up at the street level, all the way around which would have made all this buried, and yet we've already seen that they're depicting from the early days, from well before John Slezer, that it was all like it is now, with the same uneven ground all the way around. So none of that makes any sense, and none of it's accounted for in their official history. They haven't told us about what's caused the ground levels to go up and down. Starting down, then going up in John Slezer, and then back down again. I think it's far more likely that it was all way down when it was built, and then something happened to cover it up unevenly. That's probably much more likely, isn't it? Certainly in my opinion. But they haven't bothered to excavate because they don't want to excavate. Um, so if we just go back to uh, that one. So this is 1782. This is another... <laughs> Hundred years or so on from John Slether, and it looks as if since his time, some of it's been cleared away behind this Barbican, but we've still got it all high here. And then we get to nowadays, and all that's gone, and we've just got the hill coming down with the slope, like they depicted it at the very start. So, how does all this hillside miraculously appear and disappear? in between when it was originally built in the 1400s and now. So none of that makes any sense. We've got huge ground level issues. Um, right, I'm not going to spend much longer going on and on about this. Uh, I'll start winding things up, but just a couple more points about this um, Barbican. Uh, if I can just, there we go. So thinking about this, I think that one of the main reasons that they haven't excavated is because they they don't want to show what's all down here, because perhaps this structure is um, not so much got nothing to do with the palace, but is not this Barbican or fortified gate that they're telling us it is. It had a different function. Of course, even the palace could have a different function because they've been talking about this palace, as I said at the start of the video, for 200 years about it being the birthplace of Mary, Queen of Scots, and residence for the monarchs and all that. But there could be another reason. If I go back to the um, aerial photograph and just zoom out there. So this is this peel, this royal park that's right around the palace. Okay, and you can see that as well as the uneven ground everywhere, there are these kind of mounds or terracing just on the uh, east side here in this area just in front of the church and the palace. See you know all that with all these, you know, that implies that there's something under there because it's so regular rather than it just being earth because it would be smoother like elsewhere. So what's all this? Why haven't they... Was this sort of just the remains of old workhouses or sheds or outbuildings of some kind? But anyway, it's all covered up now. It's all covered up now. You've got the church there. and But I wonder if it's got something to do with this Barbican. What's under here? And I just wonder how far down it all goes. And we've got the loch nearby. You've got There was apparently a well down in that bottom kitchen. There's another big well in the middle. I might have been connected with water, but I'm just speculating now. But I just want to show you one other very curious thing about this particular area where my cursor's over, where all this terracing and mounds are. Okay, so where we are. This is an old Ordnance Survey map from 1856. And it's not, it says 1823 up there, but it is 1856. Um, anyway, if here we go. There's this peel. This is the this is our hill with the palace on top of it. Okay, and there's the loch. Okay, so uh, that's north at the top and the, the town to the south. So there's the, the hill with the palace on it. And there's 
the church here and then right over that area let's go back to the right over this area here where I was talking about you have it says the giant's grave quite clearly written there on that very area to the east of the palace and opposite the church the giant's grave there's a graveyard in the church and then here it's got the giant's grave so presumably in 1856 the whoever drew this map wrote that in and called it that because that's what it was known as at the time so that would be interesting and if it was a, a nickname or something, why? You know, it'd be interesting to find out what the story was. And you've got a graveyard there anyway, and then this is the giant's grave. That's what it says on that map, clear as anything, yeah? You saw that? Why not keep going back and forward? You, you can do it back if you want. So, there we go. Um, there's so many mysteries about this, a huge ground level issues. But I hope I've shown that as so far as I don't think most of the people that present this to the public probably never think about it, just like the public. They never think about ground levels and how was it built and so on. And, and, and uh, mud fuds, obviously, they're not thinking along those lines. So it never occurs to them. They don't, their attention isn't on that kind of thing. And they assume, like everybody else and like I used to, that everybody knows everything you need to know, that there are experts and there are scholars who can tell you every detail if you want. Because, I mean, when you go to Wikipedia, um, the tone of this, this is the, the, the basic page on the Mythical Palace, is when you read through this, I mean, there can't be anything wrong with the history because they know so much. Uh, Royal Manor existed in the site in the 12th century, um, placed by fortification known as the Peel. Um, the English fort this is the before the palace was built but the English fort was begun in March 1302 so this is the original building and it was gradually developed into what we've got now the English fort was begun in March 1302 under the supervision of two priests and they know the names of these two priests that were there in March 1302 the architect Master James of St George so another video about this guy as well it's very interesting I'll try and get around to it was also present in September 1302, 60 men and 140 women helped dig the ditches. The men were paid tuppence and the women a penny daily. So way back, hundreds of years ago, several hundred years ago, in September 1302, 1302, they know that there were two priests and Master James all standing round and that there were 60 men and 140 women and what they were paid. So they know so much detail. But in future, I'll maybe show you where I think a lot of these details come from. We'll go look at some of the sources for all this. Um, and it, it's quite interesting. You start going down the whole rabbit hole of Scottish history and how it's, how it's been assembled and developed. Uh, and I'm just beginning to scratch the surface of it. And it, it. Just like everything, when you start to look into it, it becomes all very tenuous and dodgy. But anyway, when you first read this, or any ordinary person looking this up, they think, oh gosh, we really know all about this. We've got records. Um, yeah, so that's that's the tone of that, and you can see why it would never occur to anybody to, to question the history of the palace. So how the palace looks the way it does now with all the uneven ground and everything it's not really well it never entered my head I mean I, I, I had been there a few times before it started to come across the uh, reset idea and all that and the truth stuff and I don't think it might ever have occurred to me to wonder about what's under it maybe it might have but I would never have followed it up or asked difficult questions because I, th 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 I thought that everything was covered they know everything somebody will know you know, but I hope I've shown enough anomalies and contradictions, especially with that um, John Slezer one, where he's got the the ground all high all the way around in the in the sixteen hundreds. Yeah, 
which completely contradicts because then they would have to admit then it all got filled up somehow to this height and then went back down again miraculously to the way it was originally <laughs> with the exact same elevations all round as it was before this intervention. Um, briefly touching John Slezer, Dutch or German born military engineer. So this is military engineer and artist who drew all these series of engravings, the Atrium Scotti, views of castles, abbeys, towns and seats and the ability encountered whilst travelling through Scotland in his capacity as captain of the artillery company. Um, he began making his remarkable drawings. He was an army man. You'd think he'd have drawn that Lemon Barbican if he was interested in fortifications, but no. Um, so obviously Linlithgow was one of these that I've shown you. But if you go to the the Atrium Scotty here, we are. it's very interesting because um, for most of these places, the Theatrum Scotty contains some of the earliest views that survive. Together with historical maps and geographical descriptions, the book provides key evidence of the built landscape of the period. So if that's key evidence of the built landscape around Linlithgow Palace, how did it come up to that and how did it go back down again afterwards? And details and images, choice locations and themes give us a valuable insight to Scottish nobility and genteel society at the time. Um, so this guy's very important for Scottish history because I say they always tend to show you one of his drawings when you go anywhere to look, um, you know, Melrose Abbey or Edinburgh Castle or any of these places. Um, where does it tell you? Anyway, if you go to there is, these are all the places that he drew. So I'm going to do another video where we just briefly go through them because they all have certain things in common. Um, but if I just show you maybe one, Glasgow from the south, anybody who knows Glasgow. This is John Slezer. So this is 1600s Glasgow, nothing whatsoever on the south side of the Clyde. One bridge. So that's just another example of John Slezer. So if he was accurate with that, then you've got the problems of how it got the, up to this height and then went back down again. And if he's not accurate, that's probably because he didn't want to draw the Barbican side, because I think it may well have been somebody much later imagining, like the artist's impressions that we've already seen, imagining what it might have looked like. Maybe this was somebody later in the 19th century when they were establishing Linlithgow Palace as the big historic site that it is. Imagining what it might be like and coming up with an artist's impression, basically. I'm trying to make it look more sensible with even ground and not bothering to draw the Barbican because that's too problematic, showing it almost completely buried. That would be a bit odd because it wouldn't fit with what we've got now or in the 19th century. So anyway, go on and on. I hope that's been clear enough because the site's very familiar to me now. Um, and obviously if you've just seen it for the first time, you might want to, might need to see the video a few times or you can just let me know that it doesn't make any sense and you don't understand what I'm talking about. But basically we've got all this uneven ground and it doesn't make any sense in terms of the mainstream history of the building. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you.